Okay, I think we have a, a critical mass. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning in the States and, uh, and thank you for joining our panel discussion, focusing on the topic of civil, uh, of civil society assistance in peripheral regions. It's great to see so many familiar faces. Uh, I would like to ask you to unmute yourself uh, after, after you joined the workshop. Uh, my name is Daniel Hegebusch. I serve as a fellow for Central Europe at the German Marshall Fund. And I am thrilled to introduce you our today's three speakers, Luisa Slavkova, the executive director of Sofia Platform in Bulgaria, and also the managing director of the Civics Innovation Hub, Andras Mirati, chairman of the Power of Humanity Foundation in Hungary, and Oana Preda, executive director of CERE, the Research Center for Public Participation in Romania. Luisa, Andras, Oana, thank you for joining and for sharing your rich experience with us about civil society development in rural and peripheral areas. We have a war in Europe for exactly three weeks now, uh, a war the continent has not seen since the Balkan Wars of the 90s, or as others argue, and I tend to agree with them, since 1945. And against that background, many may ask the question whether it is really the right time to discuss the nuances of civil society support in Central and Eastern Europe. I think it's the right time. And the question is not less, but perhaps even more relevant today than it used to be over the past two decades. The Russian aggression and the tearing up of the European security architecture will have different impacts on democracy assistance and the support for civil society in short and long term. In the short term, the formal unity of NATO and the European Union in face of the obvious security threat will be a key priority. And that may relativize the importance of some existing democracy related concerns or challenges in Central and Eastern Europe. Our main task in this intermediary period will be to keep the democracy agenda afloat and alive. However, in the mid and the long term, restoring and strengthening the democratic cohesion of the Western alliance system will be inevitable. And the main lessons learned of the democratic transition and the re-autocratization of certain countries in the region over the past three decades is that a top-down built democracy can also be easily disassembled in a top-down way. Democracies are stable if democratic attitudes root deeply in the fabric of the society, not only in capitals and urban centers, but everywhere. Supporting civic engagement in peripheral regions is perhaps the most crucial contribution to the preservation of democracy and is the most crucial contribution to mitigate the threat that inequality, centrum periphery, and rural urban cleavages undermine the stability of our democracies in the Central and Eastern European region. So the questions how the state of civic deserts can be overcome and how civic life can be improved, which are the questions in the main focus of Luisa's paper that will be discussed today, are more actual than ever. And before I would give the floor to Luisa very briefly about the housekeeping rules. The event will be shaped as an interactive online workshop. Following the presentations of our panelists, which will be approximately the first 35 to 40 minutes, the floor will be open to all participants to ask questions or to contribute to the discussion. The first part of the event will be uh, with the presentations will be recorded and will be available online. The second part of the discussion will be off the record to allow a more open conversation among the participants. If you would like to contribute, please simply use the raise your hand button and I will give you the floor. And having said that, over to you, Luisa. Daniel, thank you so much. Thank you also for this general introduction. Um, generous, I wanted to say, not general. Um, and thank you everyone who really did find the time, but also the mental capacity, I would say, to be engaging with something different than the war in Ukraine. Because I also feel just like Daniel, 
but there are grievances um, in our societies that are not disappearing despite the war. And so um, wanting or not, we would need to deal with them and maybe they're gonna come back um, even as uh, deeper divisions or deeper grievances that we've been experiencing in our societies. So it's a long way of saying challenges of democracy that we have been facing throughout the last, uh, what's that? Based on Freedom House's last year's quote, 15 years, they haven't and won't disappear with the war. Um, and so we would need to look into them. And one of them is obviously the discrepancies, especially in centralized countries between the big urban centers, capitals, uh, and peripheries in these countries. So I'm going to share a presentation that my colleagues and I have built along the lines of the paper we published. And the paper has the same title as the meeting today. So it's called From Civic Deserts to Civic Cohesions. What could be ways of changing civic life uh, locally in, in peripheries? Now, um, let me see how to operate this. Right. So the presentation tonight, today, is divided in these four, um, four pieces. I'm going to first talk a little bit about what a civic desert is. It's a concept that sounds quite negative and many of you might not be familiar with. Just to say in the beginning that this is not meant to insult anyone who might be living in an area that's called by literature civic desert, but it's really to draw the attention to the difference of a reality in peripheries um, in, 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 in Europe, but also I would, I would claim everywhere around the world. I'll give a little bit of a background how we came to be looking into these areas. Um, and then I will talk about the most interesting part of the paper, namely the findings we have been able to accumulate based on almost 200 online questionnaires distributed among locals in four such regions in Central and Eastern Europe. And then I'll come to speak a little bit about what are recommendations we have been able to formulate based on these um, findings. So a civic desert is a term that was coined um, in US literature a couple of years ago, observing differences in voter behaviors um, along the elections that made Donald Trump the president. And so what was discovered there is that voter behavior in parts where it, there is um, less opportunities for civic engagement differs from places where obviously civic life is thriving. And so we tried to operationalize this definition for the European context. And what we were able to identify as the two reoccurring variables in such areas is on the one hand, a deficient civic infrastructure, and on the other hand, low civic literacy. So let me unpack these a little bit. Deficient civic infrastructure means, on the one hand, the sheer lack of physical civic spaces where people would come together. Or if the places were there, they would not recognize them as their own spaces. So they would not recognize these as the place where the agora would come together. Um, but civic infrastructure refers also to the general state of civic actors locally, which means that in such areas, they're either completely missing or they are totally underfunded, um, lack capacities, competences, um, but also if they are there, they oftentimes um, become service providers, which is not to say that service providing is a bad thing in general, but it's just different from what a um, typical civic organization would do to engage in, in civic activity. So that's on the side of the civic infrastructure. Civic literacy is very often attributed to a um, general civic apathy of people in such areas. So that goes hand in hand with a lack of um, civic knowledge, um, but also energy to engage civically. So people feel exogenous to, this, to the community life. So they would expect someone else to do something for them, but they would not be the ones to be, to be picking an initiative. And so um, based on, 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 on that, and also on some other observations, we decided to look further into what are, which are these regions in Europe and what can we learn about them. And obviously the other thing we also noticed in Europe, so it's not just an American phenomenon, obviously, and especially in electoral maps of Central and Eastern Europe up until a couple of years ago, when you look at the electoral map, you would see that capitals vote differently compared to the rest of the countries. And so if anyone were to think about how to turn that tight, I think this is a good, this is a good place, place, to, uh, place to start. 
and obviously when we started um, looking for for literature and for for sources to do to do that um, that research, what we found out is that there is um, a great lack of literature. So you would find a lot of data that is naturally nationally representative, but what you do not find is data um, from these uh, peripheral regions. So hardly anyone is doing um, to speak about the European terms research on the NATS2 level. So there is hardly data available there. And as a point of departure, as I said, obviously democratic recession keeps everyone, um, everyone, uh, 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 oh well, not everyone awake, but uh, us from from this community awake. But apart from that general trend, um, we looked into, to identify these areas to study, we looked into what are the so-called desertification factors or trends. And we discovered a couple of them reoccurring, obviously in a different, um, different intensity. So these are usually areas that are literally geographically in the periphery. They're either um, border regions or are really in the periphery of periphery of Europe in a way, just so, so, so to speak. They're oftentimes also former um, imperial borders. Um, uh, one of the regions we're looking at is uh, the south of, uh, south of Romania, for example, which is the which is, has been also part of the Ottoman Empire. So these are places that somehow, because of the course of history, um, have been neglected for, for quite, some, quite some time. But also these areas exemplify high levels of all the other um, uh, you know, economic uh, and migration related plagues. So high levels of unemployment, immigration, aging population, depopulation in general. Um, they also experience uh, a, a local uh, city capture, so high levels of corruption, uh, but also they are places that have quite bad of a social and physical infrastructure. So these are places that are difficult, difficult to, to even physically reach. And so the four regions we chose to work with based on, 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 on these factors were, as it's shown in the map, the northwest of um, Bulgaria, which is also the poorest EU region. In Hungary, we chose to look into the north and northeast part of the country. In Poland, um, the northwest, so that's the Podlaskia region. And finally, Romania's, um, uh, Romania's south. The map might not be too accurate, so sorry about those who are uh, really into geography out there, but it's a small, small picture. So I promise on the website where this is published, it's a little bit better quality. And so, the in terms of the methodology, apart from obviously reading a lot of literature, um, and as I said, national level literature is available, but local level literature is not, or studies. We did this um, snowball mapping, whereby we identified small samples of civic actors in these four areas, and then they recommended yet other actors, and this is how we were able to reach totally 183 individuals working civically in these four, four regions. And the way we structured this online survey um, was the following. We picked four areas. The first one was the profile of the civic actors. So who are they really? Do they have a permanent team? How big is it? What are their annual budgets? How many years have they been active? And so on and so forth. The second batch of questions focused on to what we call the local environment in which civic actors um, really work. So what are opportunities and challenges they're facing? What trends do they re recognize? Do they actually work on some of them? How do they assess the, you know, the political culture of the target groups they work with, um, et cetera? The fourth um, section of the questionnaire was focused on the activities of the civic actors. So what do they do? Um, do they, uh, whom do they work with? Um, do they have an impact really on the very local level or do they strive for um, national level impact? And the final set of questions was focused on the capacities because this is the, this was the one of, one of our assumptions that they, they do have um, deficient capacities to operate, operate locally. And um, here are a few of the highlights from the findings. The paper gives much more background, obviously, which we won't be able to, to, um, uh, to talk about uh, tonight. 
but also on the website where the report is published, we have published each region's um, extensive data. So one could actually look into it if you were interested in, in really digging uh, locally. So one thing that doesn't come as a surprise is the really dire lack of funding. So, and I think we can basically stop the presentation here. Uh, and the moment I come to show you how big are the budgets of uh, locally rooted organizations, I think you're really going to, um, to gasp. Um, so the lack of money basically results in a lot of other things, including the impact, the sustainability, the size of teams, the ambition that one can have, the impact uh, uh, on, on various levels that one can, one can strive for. Then um, the lack of civic spaces has been confirmed by, by local actors, and especially those that, as I said in the beginning, are recognized by organizations and citizens as their own spaces. There is an interesting discrepancy it's because we also inquired some of the institutional local actors about, um, about their assessment of civic life. Interestingly, there is, a, there is a notable discrepancy between how NGOs and civic actors, so civil society actors perceive reality versus how local institutions perceive it. So when you ask the institutions what they think about spaces, they would say they're there and they're perfect. But when you ask civil society actors about them, they would say, no, they're not, they're, they're not perfect. They're not meant for us. So that's another, another, another interesting highlight. Um, organizations locally say they do lack proper capacity building opportunities and specifically pointing to the lack of capacity building opportunities that are tailored to their needs. So they would tell you that there are opportunities, but they do not match the realities on the ground. So they are made, they are like um, uh, wide brush uh, designed, but they're not necessarily looking into the real needs of, of, of civic actors. And there are a variety of topics that they would like to, like to work on. Another interesting finding was um, looking into a support network. Local actors say they rely a lot on support networks, but they are, um, but there aren't too many that they can actually um, fall back, back into. Um, an interesting finding, which is also something we have always been assuming, but it's good to have it black and white, is that local level of civic work differs a lot from what we are used to see in the national level capital-based um, civic actions. A lot of what is done on the local level is really community work, community-based, organized around creating a sense of community rather than, um, let's say, canvassing. And this is also something that I think especially the community of philanthropies should take into account because oftentimes the expectations are that local democracy work uh, should, look, should look differently. Um, interesting finding has been also that talks about minority groups locally hardly exist. So hardly anyone is focusing, looking into or perceiving minority questions as relevant to the local level, which can mean um, either that the local actors do not feel empowered to do that type of work, or that that's a topic that is way too sensitive for them, especially if you looked into conversations around um, LGBTIQ rights, for example. Then finally, when we inquired about the perception about um, political culture, so how do civic actors perceive the civic competences of, of their local communities, of their target groups, they say that in a way their heart is at the right place. So their value set is a democratic, but they do lack the knowledge and the skills. And for them, the civic apathy is attributed to a lack of knowledge and skills more so than to, um, to the values, values set. And lastly, I just wanted to highlight here the fact that um, local organizations do have impact mainly on the local, and national level region and do not go beyond that, which is important to keep in mind, especially when we say oftentimes that local voices should be heard because of the lack of capacities, they do not have the capacities to formulate whatever messages they might be able to pass on to a national or a European or international level um, because they are so focused on the, on the local level. 
So here are the examples that I promised out of these highlights. And here is the question where I uh, was partially jokingly saying that we can finish the presentation here. 37% of local actors we inquired operate on a budget less um, um, up to 5,000 euros. So we all know how little money 5,000 euros is. Um, there is basically nothing, hardly anything one can do with 5,000 euros. So this is, these are not actors who can operate, who can have teams, who can have uh, you know, sustainability, continuity of what they're doing or even upgrading. And when to these 37, you add the 31 who operate on a budget of up to 50,000, this gives you almost two thirds of the local actors. And again, here are also institutions, local institutional actors who operate on these very little, little budgets. So in a way, looking, you know, starting the support for local civic life by providing more funding, I think is the first and foremost. And I know that we might be all of us tired of talking about money because everyone who's civil society says we well, you know, Money doesn't, is not enough, funding is not enough. But I think this is really a way to point at the fact that if someone is operating on such a small budget, there is hardly, um, you know, we cannot expect people to, to fill out uh, complicated impact sheets or talk about change and uh, sustainability if this is really the resources that they need to, that they need to operate with. Here are these other examples that I that I talked about um, when it comes to perception of uh, of challenges on the local local level. Digging a little bit further into more details. So as I said, the access to financial resources is a challenge, but also access to qualified workforce. Um, those of you who are engaging with the data from um, the available civil society sustainability indices do know these things, but on the local level, the problems that national level representative studies are depicting are even, even more, so, um, uh, more so represented. Um, another highlight we've put here with my colleagues is uh, collaboration, which is also interesting to look into, obviously local uh, civil society organizations collaborate among each other, same goes for public institutions, but there is no cross-discipline collaboration, which is also important um, to keep in mind because the reasons for that can be, can be many, can be the lack of experience, can be also the lack of trust. Um, when it comes to the trends, again, and I'm sorry, this is really uh, small, uh, small letters, but it's all in the report on the website. We wanted to hear from um, the local civic actors how they rate certain certain trends, and uh, many of them didn't come as a surprise, as you know, saying that aging population is a problem, civic apathy, lack of community life, lack of trust among people, but also vis-a-vis -vis institutions, um, polarization of views, um, et cetera, et cetera. And as I also mentioned. Interestingly, even though on the national level, we do pay attention to minority questions, minority rights, local level, it did not appear to be uh, much, of a, much of a question or a concern. Organizational capacities, I did talk about, we found that compared to national level available data, local actors somehow on some of the questions we would say overrated their capacities. Our perception is that their capacities are in a dire situation that they have reported, but this is what this is what uh, the data data uh, says. Um, I'm skipping over to the recommendations. Again, they're much richer in the paper than I'll be able to to present here, and they're also not a rock in science. They also go in the two main directions in which the paper has been structured. So, what can we do to improve civic infrastructure? And what can we do to improve um, uh, civic literacy? So on um, first and foremost really is, let us all do our share uh, of the work of engaging with realities on the local level. So especially in countries like uh, Hungary and Bulgaria, which have been looked into in this report that are heavily centralized, the need to look for and build capacities of organizations outside the big uh, urban centers is, um, is crucial. Capacity building activities of all different sorts, but really also combined with 
needs assessment so that they really respond to the to the real needs on the on the local level civic education obviously i mean as a civic educator i'm biased so i cannot repeat this um, uh, more often but also engage with the findings of papers like this one that do speak about um, why local actors think there is civic apathy they ascribe it again much more to the lack of knowledge and skills than actually to the lack of uh, or to the uh, or to the values that one finds finds locally civic spaces um, i did did talk about that and the last two recommendations we've put here have to do with the really with the need uh, for more and for data at all that is on the not to level um, because um, a lot of our policies are looking into that level of regions, but data specifically looking into um, civic life, uh, civic competences, civil society state on that level is simply simply missing. And lastly, we have put a uh, we have formulated a slightly more um, exotic recommendation for which probably the time is not right, but uh, 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 why not? Uh, and it's uh, directed to the European cohesion policy, which is, as you know, an instrument that is trying to um, eradicate the differences in, um, in social cohesion in Europe. And while it focuses a lot on physical infrastructure, we thought it's also important for the European cohesion policy to actually look into civic infrastructure and how to, how to improve it and start working with the civic cohesion notion maybe. And so in the paper, you'll find a couple of um, examples of promising practices who do really do what we have identified as recommendations. And I'm really glad um, Uwana Preda is today with us from, from uh, Romania because we have featured her work and her organization as an example of a, of a promising practice. We have been also able to um, you know, uh, identify a couple of harbingers of hope in a way. So the fact that the pandemic um, motivated people to move outside of the big cities in exactly such areas does give us um, a little bit of reason to hope that um, with a different uh, uh, civic mindset, they might be able to bring in some, some, some change. And then obviously, just like as it happens always with, um, with mappings like these, there are more open questions than we were able to give an answer to. And here again is the link to the paper if you wanted to have a look at it um, and has questions or ask for a print copy, which just arrived today in our office. And I'm going to stop sharing here. Thank you so much, Luisa. Thank you for, for this very comprehensive introduction, problem mapping, and, and also for the great recommendations. And I am sure that, that we will discuss these recommendations uh, in detail uh, during the Q&A. But now I would like to give the floor to, to Andras Nirati. Uh, Andras, what are your experiences in, in Hungary regarding the, the needs of civil society organizations in peripheral regions, the challenges they face, and, and how do you try to, to address these, these issues? Over to you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Luisa. Uh, I could repeat uh, all of your thoughts. Um, it's really, really the same. Uh, in our perspective, but I don't want to do that. Uh, uh, so, but I, I need to underline uh, a couple of uh, things. Um, in Hungary, we are living in the system of national cooperation for almost 12 years, uh, which means uh, a strong centralization in all parts uh, of life, uh, in politics, in uh, institutes, in, uh, and also uh, in, the, in the civic uh, life. So this is this is the setting. Uh, it's not just that uh, that NGOs need funds or uh, or NGOs uh, need to build their bases, but it's also that there are good and supported NGOs by the state, uh, and also the the bad ones. But I but I think uh, you know uh, some some uh, stories uh, about this also. We started uh, our work and I, I uh, share uh, my screen if it's okay, just a couple of uh, slides. Can you see these growing civic communities? A picture, thank you. So uh, we started this uh, work in 2017. So uh, it was like five years ago and it was a cooperation uh, with uh, OSIFE, 
we have to admit that uh, this this was uh, the idea of OSIF at uh, that time. That let's let's see how we can move a bit far away from the capital, and uh, and move to these uh, civic deserts to to help grassroots NGOs. Of course, uh, my organization is working in a regional center. It's an a big urban center, as uh, as Luisa uh, said uh, in in this uh, report. But uh, this region is uh, maybe as not as uh, poor as as the other two. What was what was in the research, but it's also in the poorest regions of the EU. Uh, and we started this program here for uh, for four years and uh, and distributed funds. Uh, to NGOs uh, annually, uh, around uh, 350 uh, thousand dollars in a year, which uh, which is a very big amount of money uh, in the life of Hungarian NGOs. Uh, we just to just to get the idea of it, it's uh, more than the funds of the of the EGT Norwegian. Funds for the for civil society, which which uh, was uh, uh, transferred to this uh, region. So when we started uh, this work, we identified uh, a couple of problems, which was the same as we had in the report, with the strong uh, dependence, the lack of visibility, the funding problems, and that's why uh, we experienced uh, a reduced civic activity uh, in the region. So there are not really NGOs who do the watchdog role uh, to the to the institutions or to other actors, and there's no really good experiences or just a couple of of uh, individual good experiences of advocacy uh, in this rural uh, part of uh, Hungary. So uh, that was the setting where we started uh, this uh, this funding uh, project. And uh, ah, sorry, I can move like this in my ah, that's it's like that. Okay, so just a couple of numbers. So three years, uh, we supported uh, sixty projects uh, each year in each uh, cycle in the region. Uh, my count is is Baranya. It's it's down uh, there. So you can see there's a difference between the parts of the region uh, of uh, of civil uh, strength. And we knew that when we started that uh, that our city page and our county will be uh, the most uh, stronger in in this uh, sense of civil activity. But we really uh, tried to help the other two parts uh, of the region. So we focused uh, and uh, and made decisions to support NGOs there a bit easily, or uh, they don't did not have to jump the same uh, line as uh, as the others in in our uh, county and you also can uh, see that uh, with the with the cycles in the first cycle and between the third one uh, there's a really really big hunger uh, for money so uh, at the third cycle we got more than 200 applications and we we can support uh, 60 NGOs and uh, groups there. So who do we support or who did we support it in, uh, in this uh, uh, project? Uh, we try to support bigger NGOs uh, also uh, in, uh, in big cities. And uh, we also wanted to support the grassroots uh, organizations. Um, we believe that we, we succeeded in uh, that way because you can see that in each cycle, uh, one third of the project was supported in villages and, uh, and uh, NGOs from, uh, or informal groups from villages, because there was also a possibility for us to support informal uh, groups in this project. And it's really important that uh, uh, one fourth of the, of the supported groups for informal groups uh, each year. So for these, NGOs, the only way to get uh, funds is from the National Civic Fund. We, no, we now have another fancy name uh, for it, uh, connected to this national cooperation. 
Um, so that's that. That's the only funds what they uh, can have uh, yearly, and these funds are uh, are really centralized. So it's not impossible to win some money uh, there. It's mainly for for a small NGO. You can have around one thousand euro uh, for a year, averagely. Uh, I think. Uh, so it's not impossible. But how things work in Hungary, or how I see things work in Hungary, that in the first round, the the NGOs uh, really strongly connected to to politics, like both in the national level or 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 connected to the local municipalities, are the first one who who get funding, and you have to know that uh, not just the national politics are, are ruled by, by the governmental party right now, but most of the municipalities also. And most of the funds what municipalities get are also centralized to the government. So uh, that's, that's how the system uh, works and that's how uh, we need to rebuild uh, democracy in Hungary with the, with the help of, uh, of the NGO sector. Because I think that's, that's, the, that's our task uh right now because uh, the system is working uh so effectively that there are no breaks uh anymore uh not naturally in the in the judge uh system naturally in other uh institutions so i believe strongly that uh change uh can come from uh from the civic uh, life also from NGOs, but also from from uh, people who who start to uh, start to do community organizing and uh, stand up uh, for themselves. So to do that, uh, besides funding, uh, we think that we need uh, free uh, parts or free topics where we should develop the skills of NGOs and uh, and civic uh, groups. One is communication, and it also means uh, uh, internal communication, but mostly external to reach people. Because I believe that that uh, uh, NGOs and uh, and the civic uh, uh, sector is doing a, a really uh, big work and really important work uh, in Hungary, and uh, and I believe that all in the CE region, but. Uh, not as many people know about this as should. Uh, the other thing uh, is the building of the base to involve uh, volunteers, to involve people who thinks that uh, the work of that team or the work of that NGO is important uh, and, uh, and they are helping them. And also the third one is fundraising and uh, Fundraising in the way to to apply with a better project also, but all, but also to to have the skills to to make uh, crowdfunding uh, projects and have the the stability and have uh, also uh, how to say the 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 will to to ask for funding from the people. I think that's really important that. That in Hungary, most of the, the the NGOs still think that they they can't ask for support from uh, from the people or from support from from the for profit uh, sector, and we really need to change this. So that's why we are, our project. Ah, sorry, uh, is not. Oh, that's my last slide. Okay, so that's why our project is uh, is not just uh, a regranting project, but we also do capacity building. Uh, work with uh, with workshops, with uh, with a continuous, uh, maybe not mentoring because uh, we don't we did not have the capacities to mentor sixty uh, projects uh, yearly, but uh, but a continuous following to know what what is happening uh, in those uh, projects, and also uh, we we have the opportunity to to uh, to provide some coaching. Uh, for for specific uh, problems uh, in uh, in NGOs, mainly after after these uh, workshops, they have the the opportunity to 
to apply for us with a specific problem and do some uh, coaching on it. And also, it's really important, I think, to to work in networks. So we are working in different uh, NGO networks in in Hungary. The most important is the Civilization Coalition. I think uh, many of you know about this uh, coalition. And with that, we have the chance to delegate uh, problems to real professionals. So we don't need to have all the services like uh, legal services here in a, in a page, but, uh, but we can uh, easily delegate uh, to, to professionals through these uh, networks. So that was the concept. This project is, uh, this ended, these slides were from the report of this project. If, if you are interested, I can send you the whole, whole uh, report uh, of it. Uh, last year, we uh, changed a bit. Of course, uh, the funding the ended or it was not as big uh, as be before. So that, that was one thing that uh, made our cha uh, plans change. But also uh, we experienced that maybe it's more effective to work more closely uh, with NGOs, with a, with a smaller group of NGOs uh, in more specified uh, support projects uh, than this, this big uh, 60 uh, supported uh, projects in a year. So we started smaller uh, granting uh, programs and uh, more focused granting programs because uh, these growing civic communities was, was really a wide range uh, or cover, covered the really wide range of uh, problems. We just focused on, uh, on, on supporting communities uh, tackling local problems. But right now we have uh, grants uh, uh, connected to uh, Roma NGOs. And also we have uh, specific grants connected uh, to advocacy and community organizing. And we have a uh, uh, specific uh, regranting project about uh, fundraising. Uh, or doing uh, fundraising com campaigns uh, of, uh, of NGOs. So uh, our main concept right now is to, to give uh, a, a micro grant uh, around uh, maybe a thousand euros or, or uh, one and a half thousand uh, euros and uh, obligatory training program with it and also a strong uh, mentoring and peer mentoring uh, which which also good for for networking between uh, these uh, NGOs and to start future cooperations uh, with them. So uh, we really believe that that this this is our way uh, right now to to do our work. And I think I over my time limit, if I am correct. Um. Thank you so much, uh, Andras, for, for your insights and especially many thanks for, for highlighting the issue how autocratization and the phenomenon of shrinking spaces can, can really impact civic activism and, and also civil society support at, at grassroots level. And uh, as Luisa already mentioned, the, the activities of, of CHERA can be deemed really as a best practice or one of the best practices uh, in a regional comparison. So I would like to turn to, to Oana to address the questions, what are really the most promising approaches to, to support civic activism uh, in peripheral areas and to share the Romanian experiences with us? Thank you so much. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I don't, uh, don't have any slides, so I hope you'll bear with me through a, a bit more disorganized uh, presentation. Um, first, I, I would like to add two points uh, regarding the, the very, very interesting um, uh, research that Lisa presented. Um, one is about geography. Uh, definitely, the geography is very, very relevant and um, um, rural areas and peripheral, are peripheral areas are indeed civic deserts in, in Romania. Um, yet, uh, we also, also find um, uh, civic deserts beyond geography. Um, and I think these are uh, the most uh, vulnerable communities, um, um, communities uh, um, affected by poverty in different ways. 
For example, we we know uh, uh, working um, a community organizing program with people experiencing homelessness, and they definitely tick all the boxes um, for uh, for civic desert. Uh, another point I wanted to make um, regards the the weak capacity of the NGOs in uh, peripheral area. And uh, uh, there were mentioned uh, very relevant causes for this weak capacity. Another one is the, that, uh, at least for Romania, um, there's a lack of NGOs uh, in peripheral areas. So it's hard to talk about their capacity when uh, there are so few of them, and definitely so few uh, NGOs um, uh, taking the role of advocates or uh, watchdogs uh, dealing with the uh, rule of law, transparency, um, civic engagement. So I think it's, uh, it's also an issue to, to, to be addressed at, uh, at some point. In terms of uh, our work at CERE, um, we definitely do not have a, a recipe. <laughs> I, I, I don't have uh, ingredients and, and measurements. Uh, what uh, doing what we're doing we encountered uh, encounter of, of a lot of obstacles and uh, we failed a bunch of times um, um, a lot of our work is uh, learning by doing process and we are trying to do uh, the best we can can to, um, to learn and to do better next time um, our mission and our work evolves around the idea of um, balance of power between citizens and decision makers so when we talk about civic engagement, uh, we actually talk about uh, people uh, getting engaged with uh, state institutions, um, people participating to, to the decision-making process. Um, the, the tools we use um, um, are advocacy and community organizing. Um, we discovered and we started doing community organizing like uh, 13, I think 13 years ago. Uh, we started in, uh, in, in Bucharest, in the capital city, working in uh, mainstream neighborhoods um, because we didn't know, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have uh, experience for to do community organizing and we thought it's better to start in a safer space. Um, so we started here in Bucharest trying to um, identify citizens with a bit of a bit of uh, potential for activism and um, helping them get organized around their issues and helping them to advocate by themselves for the welfare of their of their communities. And after um, um, achieving some uh, uh, good results, after some progress, we decided to try to put community organizing and advocacy. Uh, in the benefit of, um, of the most uh, marginalized because we thought they are those that uh, um, have the weakest voice also and their their voice uh, needs to be heard by the by the policymakers and we we took uh, uh, two directions one was uh, working in um, um, under underserved villages so in in rural areas and another was working with uh, uh, with people experiencing uh, homelessness. And of course, we met a um, new universe of, uh, of uh, obstacles for, for participation. Um, and this could be added to um, the list of uh, causes for civic apathy. Um, um, they range from, uh, from people do not seeing themselves as, as uh, owner of rights, People not seeing themselves as citizens with uh, with rights, um, to um, people not having any expectations whatsoever from the state institutions uh, and even from the um, from the society at large, and this is a clear obstacle for, for participation. Um, another is people being um, actually afraid afraid that the state institutions could revenge. Um, on them if they uh, stand out, if they demand, if they do something. And as you imagine in a, in a, uh, in a, a poor village, um, there are many people living on, uh, dependent on social benefits. Um, people uh, build a fence or a cottage for animals without having a proper permit or whatever. And they are afraid that going to the, to the mayor asking for something um, 
uh, would would lead to to abuse. And in our work, we actually um, um, had cases of uh, mayors uh, threatening people, uh, following our community organizers to see which houses they, they visit, which people they meet, and so on. So it's not just a empty fear. Uh, it's based on on uh, on uh, on real facts. Uh, what we're trying to do in in such cases, so um, we don't just leave and 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 uh, um, um, say this is it. We we can't do we can't work here. Uh, we try to continue the community organizing work. So trying to um, to instill power in people, to inspire some collective action create awareness about civic rights, but our community organizers would take a more prominent role in, in the direct advocacy work. For example, if here in Bucharest, uh, when we support a group of citizens, uh, we help them to, to, I give you just a very, very specific example. We would help these people to prepare for a hearing with the mayor. Uh, the community organizer sometimes would go there with the people, but would stand in the back of the room just for, for support. Uh, in cases of, uh, of uh, um, um, people being afraid, the community organizer sometimes take a role uh, in representing people with the, with the local authorities, which has a lot of risks in, in terms of uh, uh, disengagement. But we also try to find as much as possible um, also, uh, ways for people to, to engage, to engage uh, um, directly. What we try to do is not to push people into risky situations and outside of their, their comfort, uh, comfort zone. For example, in one of the villages we work in, um, the mayor, uh, we work with a group of women and we got some progress there and uh, uh, the mayor um, threat this, uh, threatened these women through their husbands. So there is a new layer added um, uh, about the uh, uh, position of, of women in, in family and in the community. Of course, uh, uh, women, uh, these women took a step back. And in this case, we stopped, any, we stopped pushing for, for any advocacy. We continue to um, organize meetings, to organize workshops, organize all sorts of activities. So the, these women uh, come together, discuss about their issues, do stuff together. But we are not trying to push them to a confronta confrontation to the local uh, authorities. When we see things come down, husbands come down, women get more courage. Maybe we initiate again a petition or something. But uh, for a while, we try to be patient and not Something, uh, um, something risky. Another thing we discovered that works is to encourage people to approach issues um, um, for which the decision makers, it's not in the community, it's not the mayor or it's not the local council. For example, we work in a village and uh, people, people um, um, are stressed about the lack of uh, public transportation. This is a problem that should be, should be dealt by the, the county council, not the local council. And people had, um, had more courage to confront the county, county authorities instead of confronting their own local mayor or local council, because county council cannot cut their social benefits or you know, find them for whatever stupid reason. So uh, even if it sounds weird, uh, it was more comfortable for people to get engaged with decision makers outside of their of their community. And this is a great exercise. It's a great learning exercise. It's a great way to um, gain trust and, and so on. Um, another thing we, we managed to do, another way we find to, I don't know, to uh, avoid obstacles uh, was to work with younger people, with young people, with high school, high school students, because they are more courageous. Um, uh, they have fun. They have fun doing pictures, uh, getting involved in uh, uh, more in innovative campaigns and so on, and they have nothing to lose. Uh, they cannot be fined for building a cottage without a permit or having the social benefit card or whatever. So we find a, a, nice, uh, a, a nice twist uh, um, here, working with, uh, with young people. Uh, this also made the parents very proud 
which was a great thing because uh, these kids told us that uh, our parents were, were never uh, proud of us. Uh, now, this made the parents proud and also made them more, more um, having more, more uh, trust in, in uh, their civic rights, in uh, democracy, in their capacity to get engaged with the uh, state institutions and uh, hold accountable the, the uh, public authorities um, for the welfare of their, of their communities. So this, uh, I don't know, these are my like points of uh, for inspiration, or I don't know how, how I could, uh, could call them. Um, I'm here if you have any questions uh, about our work. Thank you so much, Oana, and, and thank you for all three speakers, because I think we really did receive three good introductions to three different sets of challenges faced uh, in peripheric regions. One is really the lack of civic infrastructure and, uh, uh, and civic skills, uh, as Luisa explained, shrinking spaces, and also the networks of, of clientelism and, and quasi semi-feudal dependency systems at local level. And I think if, uh, if stakeholders would like to, to address the challenges how to develop civil society in peripheric regions, then all of these three distinct sets uh, has, to be, has to be addressed in some or other way. Uh, I stopped the, the recording uh, uh, of our meeting and